Transmissions. Hello again, listeners. Thank you for listening to Abstract Transmissions today. We have a uh, fantastic guest, uh, one of my uh, favorite authors, hands down, Richard Chismar. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, thanks for asking me. Uh, no, I, it's it's a, it's a huge pleasure. And um, also, I forgot to mention uh, the um, owner operator of uh, Cemetery Dance uh, Publishing and uh, Magazine, correct? Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm glad to have you on. And uh, like every episode, we'll uh, start at a conversation and never get back to the uh, the beginning topic. That's usually how it goes. That's the best time. Yeah, no, Enjoy seriously. It. I. Um, so how are you? How's, uh, how's the family been? I'm good. Everyone's good. He yeah, home from college, so I've got both boys here. And uh, I think he's actually taking his, his final, uh, his last exam of the semester right now. That's fantastic. So, uh, yeah, I look forward to Noah. You know, until Noah gets uh, gets his wrapped up, and then then we can have some fun. Yeah, no, it's at the, the end of the the school year uh, coming around for uh, a lot of people. Um, well, at least in the sense that they're going on vacation and first big vacation, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Billy, Bill, uh, Billy's home until f- beginning of February, so that's right. Nice. We'll be able that's to get really some, awesome. Some good stuff done together, and then Noah will be off until middle of January, I think. That's great. I spend a lot of time at home and uh, get to. Sp- I can't imagine. My son's nine, so like I can't imagine him leaving the house. It's just absolutely mind-boggling to me. Um, yeah, it was not easy. Yeah, and no, I can't. I can't imagine um, getting adapted to you know having them leave the home and whatnot. Um, especially like with uh, my son just getting adapted to him going around the park without me. You know what I mean? Um, I'm a little bit more comfortable with it now that they put speed bumps in because it's like, I was like, fuck that, man. It was, it was <laughs> bananas. Guys are going through 40, 50 miles an hour. And um, like, I, I kind of, I, I'm not a heated person. I try not to get angry with people, but I'm super protective of my kid, you know, especially, you know, after losing uh, my wife, it's like, I can't, the thought of losing him is absolutely mind boggling. I, ca- I can't, it's just unfathomable. Um, and that type of, uh, just sheer fear. Like, I think somebody said it best. I said this before on the podcast a couple of times, but it's like having your heart walk around outside of your body, you know? Absolutely. I mean? And, uh, and that's just, it's, it's really, I think that's the hardest thing as a parent in, for me at least is just the lack of control. The fact that you have to just kind of let go at some yeah. point. And, uh, I mean, obviously you want consistency and be there for them, but it's like, letting go of that and just kind of let them go on their own is is just like letting your kid wander out near a street or something you know what i mean like it's that same yeah. type of unsurety anything could happen yeah. um and you know it's like letting them go into the deep end of the pool or the right. river for the first time or at the beach yeah no it, it uh I can tell you it gets easier, but I won't lie, and it doesn't get that much easier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does get easier. Right. In some ways, I mean, I've seen that frequently um, since he's been born. Like certain things, that I was just like, "Oh my god, this is how am I ever going to get past this?" Um, I've just consistently got easier. Um, I was very much a helicopter parent right out of the gate, oh, um, yeah. more so than my wife was. My wife was very. Um, kind of on top of things but she was also super like adamant about it was our first kid so we, you know we're hover parent and the aspect that we, we had him rear face like bought a 300 hundred dollar car seat and rear faced him until he was like four people thought we were nuts <laughs> um but uh it, it's it's uh, definitely um one of those things that it's kind of funny for me because we were talking about and i was talking about letting a kid kind of wander near the street that um that uh, that sheer horror that evokes in you as a parent transferring and i guess this will kind of transfer in the literature but uh like um pet cemetery for example the first time i ever read that that. it you're just you relate so much to you know the character that it's just that horror is so much different than um slasher horror or gore horror and and not to slight um my cat wants to come in he's gonna meow a lot yeah. sorry kitty um <laughs> uh clive barker for example very gristle uh visceral yeah gristle horror you know Absolutely. um versus that 
the emotional stuff. The emotional yeah. fear, the raw fear of being a parent and not knowing uh, what you're going to do or trying to get there in time and then ultimately failing, you know? Um, I think that... Well, I think people, yeah, that's the thing with Pet Cemetery. I think, and it was certainly the case with me, but I think it happens to pretty much everyone. There, there's, uh, if you're a big Stephen King fan, then chances are the first time you read that book, you did not have kids and there's a good chance you weren't even married or maybe... That's right. In a relationship. That's and that so was, true. Okay. And I read the book and I was just like, ah, this is a kick-ass book. And that scene was, you know, that scene was really effective. But to me, there was still scarier scenes in that book, you know, sure. back to, you know, past the, the big blow down and, 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 you know, all that. But then when you read it later in life, when you are a parent, it's like, oh, holy <laughs> yeah. You, you, I remember reading it and just thinking maybe, maybe, maybe the book changed since I read it the first time and, uh, this isn't going to happen, but uh, yeah, 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 different, no. different, different mindset. I completely agree. Uh, you, you read it older, and when you're older, especially with a kid, and everything changes in that book for you. Um, and then you connect to the characters so much more versus connecting. Like I read it when I was very young, so I think I connected more at a younger. Uh, you're not so much the 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 children, obviously, in that aspect, but. Um, the experiences of being a child and how horrifying something like that would be right. versus um, or just the connection to it versus um, the just um, in, in, I can't even explain it. The, the, the real true um, internal horror of, mm -hmm. um, of having uh, something like losing a child in, a, in just a horrific way. And then being so desperate to get back to, life is normal you know um yeah no and, I, yeah I, I i can tell i completely understand why steve doesn't like that book so much yeah absolutely absolutely um and did he he write that um bef before he had kids or after um i actually don't know I when think, that yeah, year's he had kids. release he had kids, yeah, when he wrote it, I believe, okay. but I know he just put it in a drawer and was going to leave it there, and then there's that whole story about how he, uh, um, uh, you know, had to, I guess, give Doubleday or somebody a book in mm -hmm. order to get out of a contract, so he pulled it out of a drawer. Oh, wow, I had no idea about that. That's, man, that's got to be, especially, um, like, that was must have been a tough decision at the time, but even more of a hard decision to deal with later on, like the, the repercussions of that having to deal with, maybe I didn't want to release this and I would have kept it and maybe never released it until, you know, pom posthumously or whatever. Um, yeah. And that, uh, that he, he wouldn't, um, you know, it, to keep something personal. Like I have songs personal to me that I don't think I'll ever play again for other people so much, right. you know? And then ones that are personal that relate that I, I will share, you know, but, um, yeah, I get that, that, that like, kind of like, you know, holding your art close. Um, and Absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure he still has a position. Stuff. We all do. I think he's, he has some stuff tucked away that for those similar reasons that, uh, yeah, that, he, you know, just writing it was enough. Yeah. Well, what about uh, Mr. Rich Chesmar? You got stuff tucked away, kind of the same idea? You do um, have stuff that you're just like, I don't know, you know? You know, for me, it's more, it's tucked away in, in a way that I haven't written it yet. You know, maybe one day I will, you know, I've written some stuff that's, that's pretty personal that, uh, um, you know, that I've put out there in the past and, and yeah, but there's some stuff that still would be done. Tucked away up here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Locked away. I feel that. Um, and, and it's kind of some, sometimes with music, um, uh, for me, that's my biggest, uh, I guess, um, I guess relation to it just cause I don't, I don't write. Um, but everything that I write for me, uh, musically, I mean, I guess I do write cause I write lyrics, but, um, it's just, you know, coming out of the back of my mind, just abstractly, just regurgitated uh, a couple of times into like a three or four chord song. And then it is what it is. And I just kind of let it be what it is. And I, right. you know, it comes out naturally and sometimes it's very kind of hard for me to interpret later on down the road i read it and i'm like oh wow okay i know what i felt in that time when i wrote it um but it's never you know literal um in that aspect so right. um, 
Hold on, I'm going to let the door open real quick for yeah. all our listeners, listeners, listeners to know. Kitty is uh, <laughs> not happy right now. <laughs> hey, guys. There you go. I'll pop it open for you. That's what we do here at Abstract Tr Transmissions. Super professional yeah, yeah. Uh, po podcasts with cats. <laughs> you got to take care of them. Yeah, no, they're great. They're... Uh, family members for sure um i uh so i totally lost track where we were naturally with adhd um, <laughs> <laughs> um but it's probably a good thing to kind of keep it keep it moving um i uh you know i read your material and i'm i'm absolutely blown away by some things because i connect to it in the way that i like to escape when i read it's very much, right. I don't really want to be in reality right now, and I want to disconnect, and video games don't cut it, movies don't cut it, um, but sitting down with uh, either an audiobook or a book, um, or, or you know, both at the same time, really just immersing myself in, in that, uh, that, that world uh, is huge. And so, like, something like Ditch Treasures, for example, man, it just, it, it, uh, it it um, elicits this 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 feeling. It's 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 a very endorphin like kind of thing, but at the same time, it's uh, hey kitty, uh, realistic in the aspect that um, we're gonna move that keyboard out of the way to avoid any major issues. <laughs> um, in a way that you you connect to it and hear um, the, the the narrative almost in your head and it's playing out as a movie. Um, right, and I. Uh, with something like um like ditch treasures i'm so jarred by it that i i just i can't like the jaunt for example that's right you know you just it's uh, and i really i dig science fiction a lot so that's what connected me to steven uh the dark tower i that was the first thing i ever read by him actually you're in the talisman now right yeah again yeah. uh for like the tw the third time um and uh, my son absolutely loves it um, thank you for kind of validating my thoughts there <laughs> yeah no, no that's a great one that one's that that one i always think and, and i had to be talked into reading that you know i, I uh it, i don't know why i mean the same thing with the dark power stuff i uh, i'm a big you know people always told me talisman was like uh you know, Mark Twain writing alongside uh, Steve, you know, it was an adventure story, this, this youthful adventure story. And uh, I, uh, you know, I love that kind of thing, but because of the fantasy, because of the kind of, you know, uh, fantastical elements that aren't, you know, necessarily always dark. And it was the same thing with the dark tower. You know, I hear talking trains, come on, you know, right. um, and, and dark tower, I'm a huge Western fan and I'm a huge Stephen King fan. And it took me decades. Sure to read it so I, I thank the people who did talk me into reading it and um yeah i mean talisman i loved you know it it it, it alternately fills up your heart and breaks your heart it right kind of story but it's just such a great story and uh, really encompasses what you know we all love steve for and and peter straub also you know absolutely i um and that that kind of led me uh to to him the same way uh, Stephen, um you know be honest uh, brought me to you i i actually had never read really much uh, literature other than Robert Heinlein, um, Michael Crichton, uh, Asimov. Um, and then like I read it and started the, the gunslinger, but only got to Wastelands and never read anything else. Right. Uh, the Wasteland. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, anyway, I, uh, I, I started reading Stephen King again uh, when I was, 25 and then just read everything i could fervently got to gwendy read everything there and then read everything that i could um really mostly at first by audiobook because i had you know i was trying to balance everything between um selling appliances at the time and home life and the tumultuousness of kind of some stuff that was going on um uh and it really uh i just Absolutely. That's kind of how it, it's the same thing. I think that's true with anybody with ADHD. When you find something that you really love, you just binge it. You hyper focus on it. And um, oh yeah, absolutely. I just I, I really uh, I loved uh, every every second um, 
of that literature. Um, and so, and I'm not saying that just as a fanboy because totally am, but <laughs> I, uh, I really, really <laughs> love that when I hear an, 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 an author that just, it seems like to me, and I don't know if this is the way you write or if you plan things out ahead of time, but it seems like you're just going for what you nat- what your mate, your brain produces. Um, and that I feel yeah, I have I'm such a, big, a connection yeah. to that. Yeah. I'm not a big plotter or a big, you know, um, you know, uh, intricate outliner, that kind of thing. I kind of just go on, uh, uh, you know what we talked about. I kind of write from an emotional place. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've, I've said it a couple of times recently. Uh, there was a point, you know, when I started, I always tried to kind of reinvent the wheel. And I thought I had to have these really intricate plots with twists and turns and surprises around every corner. And, um, you know, that each story had to be much more of this machine, this well-oiled machine. And, and, uh, and I actually think that that hurt my writing. I think, number one, it, a lot of it kind of came out and it wasn't very authentic. You know, um, you could kind of see the nuts and bolts of the stories and as I was trying to do things. And I think that's the case a lot of times with younger writers. Um, but then I discovered a, a, a writer named Ed Gorman, who, who was a really great uh, and, and he's no longer with us as of a few years ago. But he, he was he was uh, my my first big you know writing mentor. Um, great crime. He wrote everything. Crime, mystery, suspense, science fiction, fantasy, horror, westerns. Um, but tons of his stuff still out there, mainly, you know, in the used stores and, um, worth checking out, but, but reading his story, yeah, what he taught me is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely worth it. I mean, you'll, you'll see his voice in, in my work. Um, you'll see his voice in, in a lot of, uh, you know, there's some King in there and, 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 but, but he's, he's just definitely uniquely his own. Um, but, uh, yeah, he, uh, reading his short stories in particular, um, you know, a lot of times they weren't, uh, they weren't plot heavy at all. They're, you know, this story might be about a, a man sitting at a bus stop who, who meets uh, an older woman who you find out is, is, you know, leaving her, her, you know, abusive husband or something. And it's all about the conversation they have. And then they go their separate ways. It's just these little moments in time and slices of life. And it made me, it helped, it helped me to understand that that, is you know being honest to to the story you're trying to tell is is the most important thing i think at least for me as a writer so that's what i found is that you know my stories tend to be about either a person a place or a moment in time that's just important to me and i go from there a lot of times that's all i have is is i see the the image of the young unwed mother at at a payphone when they still had those holding the hand of her little girl whose feet are barefoot and her hands are dirty and her face is sticky and I think uh, there's a story there and I, that's, you know, where it starts or that's in the middle or that's the end, but I just wrap it around, around that. And that, and that, that taught me a lot. You know, I think that's when my stories started to become more honest and authentic and, um, and have heart, you know, and emotion. And, and that's what people ended up responding to because once I started writing those kind of stories and I felt really happy about them, that's when I really started getting reader feedback from, uh, from folks who, who, who kind of connected. Wow, that's amazing. I um and fascinating because I can kind of see that kind of progressively in some ways. And it, and not necessarily in stuff that uh maybe you've released, but um well, maybe uh, I guess in that aspect. But I, I really that that's absolutely um fascinating to me. Um that you can kind of visualize something and then just kind of build around that and uh it just kind of naturally happens. Uh I kind of feel like it, it's very similar uh, for me um, as a, as a creator, but um, outside of that, I think that the nice thing we were talking about, maybe not so much the monotony of individual characters and their conversations, but <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> but there um, the fact that, I mean, I think people like that now when you look at things like the Sims or any of these different, you know, video games, things that where people just want to go into another point, um, the long form conversation podcasts where they want that dialogue, they want that human interaction because, um, and th- maybe this can be a connection more so in the digital age too. And we may find that, I don't know, um, as the species moves along, but the connection to, um, the 
reality, you know, back to just human interaction and conversation and, 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 um, and personal experiences. And sometimes you just don't want them to be yours. Right. Um, it's nice to visualize that in your head um, and just connect to well, that. Sometimes reality. you do want to, you want to be able to relate to it. Yeah. You know, I, I know with, with Wendy's magic feather, um, th- what a lot of the, the really positive responses that I get back about the book and, and, and trust me, I got plenty that weren't nec- necessarily so positive, but, you know, Oh, I wanted more to happen. And I wanted this and that, of yeah. course, and that's fine. But sure. The, the positive responses that I, that I received, so many of them were just about um, the fact that they were pleased they got to see um, a, a, a real glimpse into uh, her personal life with her mother and her father, um, with one of her closest friends, you know, from high school. Absolutely. Uh, but, but particularly the mom and the dad, I, you know, I, I received so many messages from people saying her relationship with her mom reminded me of my relationship with my mom that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, and that, you know, I, I certainly drew on, you know, a lot of personal experience for that. And then other, you know, other stuff, hell, you're just making it up. But that's, that's, that's sure. always very cool and satisfying when you, uh, when you hear back from people and they're like, yeah, you know, I related to that. So I think it's, I think it's the same thing. I think in some cases, definitely you want them to, uh, to feel like it's the escape and, um, and, uh, you know, a, a safe place to go to, to get away from their own life or whatever's going on out in the world. And then I think in other cases, it's a nice, it's a nice reminder for them. That's right. Yeah, I, I act absolutely um, um, f- f- feel that way when I um, absorb literature. Um, and in, in ways that you get, it evokes a lot of feelings and it's not always a happy feeling, right? Mm-hmm. The, um, after the bombs for me, I do, I literally sat here and kind of, uh, I, I cried, man. It was, that, that, that was incredibly touching. Um, and I guess, you know, there's some personal, um, emotional connections to it. Sure. Um, but that, that real, real connection that you can make as a human being to those characters and they become far less fictional and almost, you know, hundred percent real. Right. Um, and I think having somebody be able to produce that is, is just, um, it's a staple to everything that we are as, uh, as human beings. Um, and I think that 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 really that was one of the first times um, I think I ever really had that connection, and I'm, I'm sure there was it was because it was very personal at the time and yeah. and everything. Uh, but that that type of connection, I, you you can't. There's no um, there's no trade off that you can't get that always from a movie. Even even when you're really it hits you. It's a tearjerker. It, it it punches right. you. Um, it's not as much as is is connecting to the thoughts and feelings. Well, yeah, with a movie, you're you're staring at an actor or an actress, and and um, even if you're even if they're portraying something that may have happened exactly the same way to you, or in a similar way, or as a parallel, you're still staring at other faces, other movements. Um, and I think when you're reading that those written words on the page whether you want it to or not, you're forming your own images, you're forming your own tone of voices, your own, the, the sound of the voices and all that. So sometimes it's, it's much, it's, uh, I, I don't think sometimes, I think almost always it's a much more personal <laughs> Very much know, so. experience. And, and yeah, I mean, and you, you say, you make a good point about it, about it not always being happy. And that's the thing. I mean, in my fiction, most of it is, there is a sense of a real melancholy mm-hmm. in, in a lot of it. Um, um, usually tinged with hope, mm-hmm. uh, our hopeful thoughts there too. Um, and then I'm sometimes a, you crush that hope. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's good it, though. It makes the sense. The funny thing is I'm, this, I'm a very optimistic person. Mm-hmm. I'm a goofy person. Um, Billy just walked in and out and I, he could vouch for that. I'm, you know, <laughs> I, I'm a practical joker. I'm a big kid and all that. So yeah. And this first, uh, like 10 years of writing people in my life uh you know friends my uh my wife um family members that there was a, there was a an adjustment period to kind of balance out the real me with what i was writing 
Sure. Um, but what was interesting is the people who really knew me knew that 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 was honesty going on, honesty um, and authenticity going on the page because I, it's just how I've always been. I am, I am really, like I said, a big kid and goofy, but um, I, I see the world, you know, through, uh, and, and like I said, despite what I said about being a really hopeful, optimistic person, I still, I still tend to see that, that the darkness and the sadness. I've, and I've always been like that. I mean, I, I well, I, if I was 12 years old and I saw an old person standing on the sidewalk, um, you know, holding, holding a, a bag, like a rucksack type thing, you know, somebody else driving by that older person might think, Oh, look at that cute little old man. I, for whatever reason, I would think things like, Oh, I wonder if his wife had passed and he was doing laundry at a laundry yeah. room. things right. like that. It's just how I, I always saw things. And, and it, uh, I think that, uh, that's, that's crazy. I, I, I actually, I was just talking to a friend, a friend of mine yesterday about like how I'll jokingly, I mean, I'm using this, a lot of times it's, it's jokingly cause I'm not, you know, um, as good, I guess, as creating things in, in my mind, uh, like entire like, real, realities and i'll get back to that but i'll like you know make an entire backstory for this person i just saw just by what they're going through what they're riding or and it just pops in my head you can't you can't control it sometimes and yeah, whether you right. joke about it or not um for some people that just happens um and i uh i just that's funny i, I connect to that a lot um but also in the uh the fact that i think that that makes really amazing writing um, and makes it so much more real for the writer because it's not, it, nothing in life is really always um, as perfect and ever. <laughs> I think that there's a mixture and it's not always bad either. I think it's a right. lot of how you see it, like 70% of what happens to us, 20 or 30% how we deal with it rather. Um, and then they, that outlook, but I, I just, I think that a lot of people can't always, Ex wouldn't accept something completely always happy like not to get off topic in any way but the matrix for example they had an anime the animatrix and i remember one of the stories in it was talking about why it was so it had to be reality and it couldn't be a utopia uh, is that human beings wouldn't accept um, this alternate reality in which everything's perfect so they just they just their brains just wouldn't accept that program yeah i can see that um but yeah, not to get not get off topic, but that that that's amazing. I, I really connect to that uh, <laughs> um, when I you know just uh, making backstories for people when you see it, and that's amazing that that's where some of that uh, um, those worlds. I think, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the, the funny thing is I think when you do talk to other writers or other creators, artists, you know, songwriters and musicians, I think there's use, that's usually a, a theme that runs through it for them. You know, um, I mean, I, I can remember fishing. By a railroad bridge and seeing the train blast by and seeing the passengers in the window and, and wanting to know where they were going, where they were coming from, what their lives were like. And I've heard that same story from other people. Um, so it's just, yeah, I think it's that, uh, you know, that you kind of on one hand is kind of voyeuristic. On the other hand, it's kind of, you know, playing God because you can make those stories up and, and make them sure. true. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a certain amount of, uh, you know, empathy that goes into it because, because you actually care. Did you feel for them? And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, cause I, yeah, I, I know with me, as far as that kind of sense of melancholy that runs through a lot of it, you know, I don't want to feel that way, you know, right. but I do, you You're know, right. I like, uh, I'm, I'm a big dork. I like Christmas songs, but you know what? Most Christmas songs that I hear in kind of a melancholy way, yeah. you know, there's a sad new film and um, yeah, sure. it's just interesting. Retail used to do that to me. I saw it. <laughs> appliances for ten years, and oh my god, Sears! They just right after, right after. And it's almost like right after the ha Halloween ended. Not even so much Thanksgiving. It's just like, boom, Mariah Carey, right out of the gate. All I want for Christmas, that high note. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <Okay>. good God! <laughs> and I don't have anything against her. No offense to her. She made a career and amazing career, obviously, but not really my jam. And the big thing is I just had to get to just eat it every, every single year yeah, yeah, yeah. on repeat for eight hours a day, you know? <laughs> uh, but um, I, uh, I think that's really amazing. And for listeners uh, out there too, that are creators and, and 
and and you don't always have this constant positive energy and everything and and sometimes you can manifest that into what you're creating um, right and that's where i think sad music comes from for sure and and why uh, why people write based on personal experience um i just have a hard time i guess writing very literally um mm-hmm. So it, it allows people to interpret, however. Um, and for me, I always liked that about music. Maybe I didn't know what they were writing about, but I made my connection to it. Um, and for right. me, that was what it was. Um, so if I, uh, if I ever do that for anybody, then I'll, I'll have done my job as a musician. I don't really care about getting too far with it. I just like doing what I'm doing, right? Being happy and passionate That's about it is everything. Um, I remember feeling like I had to jump in everything, each thing I do, I rush through so I can do something else. Right. And such the ways do days do pass or something like that. I forget. It's from insomnia. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, that's uh Steven D. I don't remember his last name. Uh, quote, <laughs> I think, right. um, which is just fascinating to me um, that it's so ac- accurate. Like that, that book makes you feel older. You can connect in a way that you're not older, but you know, in a way, I guess. Um, and it's, it's right. Like don't live waiting for the next thing to happen for more money for the the hotter girlfriend, whatever the hell it is, because you might need the person that cares about you. That's going to wipe your ass for the rest of your life. Like you you don't know what the fuck's going to happen around the corner and it could be anything. So live your life. Like you might not have it tomorrow because it very well may not exist uh, for you. Shit. We could all get hit with a near earth object because we're spending money in defense instead of looking up to the goddamn sky. (laughs) So I won't go on a rant this time. We don't, I don't want to waste our time doing that. (laughs) But I, I, it drives me bananas that there's just no logic thought and it's a whole bunch of cognitive dissonance and rat racing to the end of humanity. So Yeah, no, it's uh <laughs> it's interesting, man, because I know I agree there's a lot of people with 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 messed up priorities and uh not to have a you know, negative outlook, <laughs> sorry. No, I mean it, it's it's not even I don't even look at because I don't even look at it as like this you know, who the hell am I to tell anybody what to do, you know, or how they yeah. feel, I, you know, I, feel so I certainly feel that way. But at the same time, I feel like there's, and, and someone could turn this around on me and use the same word, but I, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of lost souls out there. And, uh, you yeah. know, I, it's one of the interesting things about being a dad is, is I think just based on my life experiences where, um, you know, uh, and and you can certainly relate to this, uh, you know, where I've lost, you know, uh, more than a handful of people who I've been very close to. And, and, uh, you know, at this point in my life, parents are gone and others, but I've, you know, I've lost friends. I've lost an older sister. I've lost people in my life um, at times when they should have still been there. I had cancer twice by the time I was 30. Um, Jesus. Uh, you know, in, even my work experience, I've been working my ass off through my 20s and, and 30s. And I mean, crazy long weeks and no vacations and um, right. and then kind of, you know, finding uh, some success and, you know, continuing to work hard and then finally taking it easy. And, and now I'm spending a lot more time writing than I am on the publication side. And it's just, you know, as a father it's interesting trying to find that balance of telling your boys, yeah, go out there and grab the world by both hands and, 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 and seize it and, you know, do good. And, and the flip side of that coin is just find peace, you right. know, just find peace and, and genuine happiness and don't care about your bank account. And, um, you sure. know, it, it's hard because yeah, you want them to have nice things and, and, and be able to experience nice things um, and have that security. But at the same time, to me, and again, it's a very personal viewpoint. Um, Absolutely. Again, to me, that's where, you know, uh, the financial stuff kind of is a means to an end because if it can help you have that security and then it can help you contribute to you finding your, that peace in your life. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, you know, that's a long rambling way of just saying, yeah, you know, as a dad, I do. I, I kind of reinforce that to my boys all the time is, uh, that's you huge. know, 
That's so freaking huge, actually. Yeah, and at, but at the same time, you know, I, they they I was their coach growing up, and, and so they always heard. I mean, my my youngest son just wrote a college essay about me where you know he's talking about my coaching philosophy and and you know hard work is underrated and and you know kind of what my team philosophy was, and he, and he kind of regurgitated a lot of the things I used to say. That's and they're awesome. both they're both are really hard workers. I mean, they're both um, really they like being part of a team. They like being uh, part of a uh, you know, a group that kind of has a common goal and they're very selfless. But th the big thing is, is, and they've both been called it by coaches, teachers, peers, you know, the hardest working, you know, they're both right now seniors, one in high school, one in college. They're both, they're both captains of the lacrosse team. Um, you know, that's not about a dad saying, hey, isn't that cool? You know, I'm proud of my son. He's a captain. It's, it's, it, it really is just kind of a, a look that's at, so awesome. um, you know, because way back when I was, I was the captain and it's, it's, it's looking at their work ethic and their leadership skills and their ability to kind of, uh, um, you know, take care and deal with 35 other, you know, individuals. And, and, and that's what I've always told. I mean, I used to tell the boys that too, you know, you'll have no bigger honor than if you're eventually, you know, elected a captain as far as in sports, you know, by your peers. Right. It's hard to get 35 guys to agree on anything. Absolutely. So, so it's hard to get like five guys to agree on Yeah, exactly. In a band. So anyway, oh so, yeah. so, you know, I'm kind of chasing my tail here, but it, it's, that's no, not the no. thing to me that, that I, I'm able to look back and see, you know, and they certainly learn that from their, from their mother too on yeah. a daily basis, but it's cool that they have that empathy for other people. They have that understanding. They have crazy hard work ethics, but at the same time, I do think, you know, they don't, they don't care about what kind of cars they're going to drive and, and, and all awesome. that stuff. And, and it's something that I hope stays with them because it's, you know, right. I can't emphasize it enough. And when I talk to, sure. to groups of young people, I, I constantly say, it. So, you know, it, it, to me, that's the end game. You find that peace of mind and that happiness and, and everything else follows, you know, good stuff follows the, one way or another. And, uh, here, here, me, man. That's a big thing. I, uh, I'm struggling with a lot of it because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm still working through the grief of losing Kayla in some aspects, but you're right about the aspect that I think, why you know life isn't about like trying to just get one up yourself until you die basically right. you know and that's all you're doing is jumping hurdles for the rest of life until it ends you know and that's that's crazy because i think finding connection and what sets you on fire is a better better thing to show your kids in yeah. my opinion uh than to work your way your life and no offense i'm not trashing on people that work in factory jobs in any way because I did it. I just couldn't do it. I was bad at it. They're better at it than I was. They're better, harder workers than I, than I was. So no way it's a negative towards them, but I wouldn't want to do that for the rest of my life. And then look back and just be like, you know, if that provides you, like you said, all the time in the world for your kids and that's what you love or all the time in the world to work on your motorcycle because that's what you love or start the bakery, that Absolutely. But to just do it and hate your life and to the point where you drank yourself to death or you do something like uh, just become obsessed with everything and it becomes so tumultuous and chaotic and pressure that they literally have a heart attack or right. kill themselves or anything like that. That's the antithesis of what I think we're meant to do here as a species is find the thing that fits you because some people shipbuilding is what sets them on fire. Right. right. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, some people, yeah. I mean, some people, it's, and I learned this, you know, like working summer jobs, you know, who are the guys who are like laying bricks or, or doing, you know, uh, um, concrete work. And some of them are, some of them are absolutely legitimate artists, the way they can do what they're doing. They love what they're doing. Right. They take great satisfaction and pride in it. And, and they should. Absolutely. And they get home every day and they don't have to take their work home with Damn them. Right. And, it, and then they start again the next day. And it's like, man, I can respect that. I can respect the guy who, who cleans the school's floors and, and the lunch tables and stuff. If he, mm -hmm. if he, if he walks away with a sense of pride that, you know, Hey, I took care of 450 kids today. That should be it. And right. I'm part of this said. team and, you know, that kind of thing Then absolutely, you know, um, it, it, to me, it's just all about that peace and, and that, that inner peace of mind and, and, and kind of, uh, and I'm a, I'm a weird cat. So yeah, <laughs> like, kind of like you said, I don't know what I do <laughs> if I wasn't doing what I'm doing. And I think that's why I was so, you know, I got a lot of uh, props for, for working so hard and, and kind of sticking with it through those first, you know, that first decade of, of, you know, looking for loose change in your car and, 
and being happy because somebody actually sent you a $20 bill through the mail for a subscription and you can run out to the mall with your wife and get pizza and soda. Um, sure. You know, um, but I think one of the reasons I was so stubborn, I mean, I learned my work ethic from my father. So, so I had some good, some good, uh, I had some good bones there to build on, but it, I think one of the reasons I was so stubborn is because I didn't know what the hell else I was going to do. Um, right. You know, I had a journalism degree from a really good school, so I could have went and written for a paper, and I would have been okay for a while. But, uh, but yeah, it wasn't what was in my heart, and uh, I, I think, I, yeah, I was definitely willing to struggle because I believed it would, it, it, you know, that it could become a reality. But, um, yeah, I'm one of those weird guys that, you know, if I wasn't doing this, God knows what I'd be doing. That's, um, that's huge to hear because – makes me feel a hell of a lot better about continuously just striving for music. And you said earlier about balance, like I, uh, not to just completely circle back, but, um, and trying to maintain that passion, show your kids that you're doing what you love, also providing for them mm -hmm. and then finding a way to schedule it all out and manage it. Um, and I mean, some people are hyper organized, so that just goes smoothly in that aspect. Um, but then they obsess a lot. So there's, you know, that was me for, side. for a decade or so. Yeah. yeah. I'm on the yeah. other end of the spectrum. I'm all over the fucking place and yeah, yeah. trying to get myself into a schedule has been unbelievably hard, but like Gavin needs it because it's just me right. now. Right. And <clears throat> I've got to make sure that it's the same thing every day and I'm not doing that. And then there's a lot of emotional dysregulation because of the ADHD and the electronics usage and, and then my obsessive guilt about it. And you know, I shit on yourself about certain things and you're like, I did everything in the world today, but it's still not enough. Um, and, uh, and that's just an awful feeling. That's the, the Stephen Dobbins quote again. And I just try so damn hard. I wrote it on my mirror in my bathroom because it's just a reminder for me to stay focused on what matters and that's being in the goddamn moment. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, that's the key. I think what humanity is getting put through right now, this major transformational shift, or maybe it's just a social divide thing, whatever it is, we're going through something. And I think what we need to learn the ending, you know, lesson to be learned here when we die is that you know, life can never be perfect. There's a lyric wrote that actually yeah. but i didn't want to just say it that way but i came out anyway um and then you know that that life is being in the moment you know everything you want to be in that moment is is what matters because like right now we're talking and i am super engaged and this is one of the best conversations i've had and i love doing what i'm doing yeah. i'm not you know i was a little nervous at the beginning but it's like every sale that i've ever done or anything like that i, I you know i didn't care about that i care about conversations like this because right. conversations like this is what gets us out of the keyboard warrior keyboard hammering warrior of the future you know i, I hope that we we get out of that you know yeah sorry for the delay thing there i keep on cutting you off i don't mean to do uh, no 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 um, th there's, uh, that, that one thing I think, um, that it keeps bringing me back is, um, is that, that need to find that connection to, um, something that sets you on fire. This guy named Gary V I think Gary Vaynerchuk on uh, YouTube it, he had a winery and like a YouTube thing and like was on Joe Rogan and, and really interesting in the aspect that, um, he was like, no, dude, you, you know what? I didn't do anything until I was 38 or 40 or something like that. His whole life blew up at 40 or 38. Or He's like, right. stop thinking that everything is in your 20s. Stop thinking that life ends at 30. Like, Move forward. Do what you love. Do what sets you on fire. Find the job that can pay for that. And just you know, put your nose down. Put the phone down more. Stop worrying what people think. Because you can't control all that. And um, yeah, I think that's, yeah, a, that's a big thing. thing. I, I not caring about what people think and not being afraid to fail. Again, those are all, you know, definitely kind of common themes that I would talk to, you know, groups about and, and that my kids have, have grown up with that, those philosophies in mind. And I mean, I, I honestly, you know, not to sound like a, you know, the wise old owl fart up in the tree, cause I'm <laughs> certainly not my way to vouch for that. I actually suck at my kids. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just that, 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 and again, it's something that, that really came out of my coaching was, you know, you give me, 
you know, give me 20 guys who aren't afraid to scrape, crawl, um, look dumb doing it, look bad doing it. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, and I'll beat any team that has a bunch of really, really elite, talented kids who still want to look cool while they're playing and, and don't want to, you know, if they fall down, they're going to make a joke of it instead of crawling to their feet and getting up as quick as they can. And, and, and I think doing it, really, it again. And I yeah. think it, yeah. And I think that really does transfer over to life. And I mean, that's odd, you know, people will ask, you know, well, what, what kind of, uh, you know, secret formula did you have, you know, in order to, to build this company and da, da, da. And I always just said, you know, the, the secret formula was, was working hard as hard as I could um, with that idea in the back of my head. And it's the only time I was ever really competitive and, and it's not really more of a, so much of a competitive thing as it was just a mindset, but I wasn't going to let anybody outwork me. That was right. one. And then That's the awesome. other thing was, I just, you know, I accepted failure and, and speed bumps and all that stuff as part of the process. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to get embarrassed. You're going to make a fool of yourself. You're going to have a whole lot of bad days. Where the apartment that my wife and I used to live in, um, the second one after we got married, when the business really started kicking, um, and she was in physical therapy school. It had a hill outside. And uh, she, she knew that if she pulled into the parking lot after classes, if I was sitting up on that hill, oh, shit, it was a bad day. And we actually nicknamed it Misery Hill um, because that's kind of just where I would go to kind of, you know, exhale and, yeah. and get out of the cramped apartment full of boxes and um, where so much of the day came down to, you know, the trip to the post office to the P.O. box because you needed checks to keep going and you'd open that box and there'd be no checks or there'd be one. And you'd be like, shit, you know, mm -hmm. here we go. Tomorrow's a new day. And then, so yeah, yeah, it, uh, uh, you know, my big secret was was not letting anyone outwork me, and uh, and just absolutely being willing to fail and and get up again and take the hits. That's the thing. I you know I used to kind of draw a parallel to being a fighter and just you know you got to take the hits, take just punches, yeah. And um, and that's again as a father, it's something I've I've tried to to you know transfer over and and I think it's you know it, it's uh it's the only way I could look at it. You know, and there was still, even once I started, started becoming successful, you know, there was, there were still those feelings of, you know, why me? Because I knew there were plenty of other people working their butts off also. Mm. Yeah. Um, but you, yeah, you just have to work to get past that because otherwise you you just keep chasing your tail. So. Yeah, I, I absolutely um, agree. I mean, you can't, like, I, I remember I was in a band called uh, Unrest and Transit. It was a metal band. First metal rig heavy thing I had ever done. I wasn't really into, uh, a whole bunch of technical metal and but we just kind of it happened that way and ended up being a really heavier band uh but i've i connected to it in the aspect that i was able to provide something different that wasn't everybody's thing um but it didn't sound like anything else and that's what people i feel like linked to and it's it's always been hard for me to be like no we were actually a really good band um versus giving myself the worst hardest credit all the time being the toughest credit um but i think that that keeps gives you a certain amount of integrity and keeps your expectations high for yourself uh, and it's always a battle with yourself uh but like you're saying um and i kind of connected to this when you're trying to manage uh, like uh you want to get a bunch of people that are all doing it because they love it and that they're passionate and they'll do it. no matter how many times they fall down I had like seven bands that i was really trying to get serious you just pick yourself up and you do it again and it's hard to have that tenacity but like you said um it's it's that tenacity and that passion and that fire that keeps people going and i think that's that is the key to success any of the other bullshit is is it's bullshit it's chaos it's it's just white noise you know um and people if they see it as what it is is like do what you love and you're going to be successful as long as you're willing to accept that's going to be hard work you got to put the time in you, there's going to be failures um and i am by no means successful uh yeah we've got you know a couple hundred listeners and um you know i i love doing this but you know music had always been my thing that set me on fire appliances i was okay at and i found interesting but it was just the thing that i could not hate enough so i could be a functional member of society long right. enough to be able to support my art um and then even then it was getting fired for putting in FMLA paperwork, which is just, it sucked because I worked really hard at the appliance thing. So my whole world crashed when they're like, we're going to have to let you go. Cause your attendance, I'm like, 
dude, I just did what you guys said. I put in the disability paperwork. I, I'm, you know, I'm scattered. I know I, I screw up a lot, but between the ADHD, my ankles, my wife's health, my life is falling apart. You guys are supposed to be the family company to accept me in. I left a you know, Samsung job, yada, yada, yada. Right, right. Cry story, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. It's uh, it, people on the, online are probably rolling their eyes again, listeners. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, for me, it just it was really real. And it was so hard to not fall into depression. And the thing that got me out of it was like, you know what? I'm going to make an, a podcast about appliances. And then pretty soon it was like, fuck appliances, man. <laughs> like, fuck appliances. Like, I hate consumerism. It's why right, I left right. the Samsung job and tried to go to Solar City. I wanted to do right. something more altruistic. That failed went back to samsung and then it was like here's a job you gotta fly to dallas i don't want to i want to be home with my family i don't want to be flying everywhere yeah. um and it wasn't good for my mental health I was drinking more yada yada anyway i, I know we were running up on time here and i don't want to keep you too too long because uh you're an incredibly busy man and i, I really I thank you enough i can't thank you enough um but uh that that time um you know it was just Time is everything. Time is, it's hard to manage. It's hard to not lose. Um, and it's hard to not, you know, to just be accepting of the fact that it moves. And the relativity of that is, I feel like, how you look at it. If you're really excited and like I am for this uh, conversation, it's very, you know, back and forth, it's engaging and it moves quickly in my mind. Like it's so fast. Whereas if I was just here and I was bored and I had nothing to do, and that same amount of time would feel like endlessness. Um, right. And I think that's something that we need to remember when we're told as kids, life's going to move fast. And as you get older, it moves faster. It's not that it actually moves faster. It's that your perception of it is moving it right along for you. And I, I want to hold on to those moments and, and, and it just, you know, cherish it. I got to play the main stage at the Palladium at the Worcester Palladium. And that was a biggest moment for wow. me as a musician so yeah. huge i got to play in front of 2200 people f opening we we're the only band to open for a bunch of, it was a big moment for me yeah but it moved like a second and i look back on that and um my guitarist uh who passed away like right before kayla um he he was just he was in the moment and, and we talked about it so many times and I, I was a little jealous in the way that like, I, I, I loved it. We all both in the same place at the same time, but for him, I feel like it just, he, he was really good. Even though his time on this earth was short, he was really good at being in that moment yeah. and being so just engaged in it. Um, and I think that, yeah, I guess that just brings back and I'm being kind of redundant uh, before you go. This is uh, this is something super important to me, uh, and uh, springboard from earlier ditch treasures, uh, <laughs> aliens. Yeah, not necessarily aliens, but UAPs. Now CNN and all them kind of saying UFOs exist. We don't know what they are. We're not saying they're aliens, but right, right. What's your thoughts? No, I'm a believer. I've always been a believer. Mm -hmm. um, you know. And my friends would laugh and say, well, the part of the problem is he still believes in Bigfoot and stuff too. And I'm like, yeah, I've always had, I've always been the dreamer who, uh, who kind of, but that's just kind of how I look at the world. I, I just feel like it's, it's gotta be so full of miracles and, uh, and unexplained, um, you know, wow. phenomena. And yeah. I just, yeah, as far as, you know, beings from other places, absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, so huge and vast mathematically they say it's almost impossible for that life to not exist right i mean it's got to exist it's whether they yeah. can travel you know i just finished writing the third gwindy book with stephen king and and, and just the the line you know there are other worlds than uh, than these and uh, then you know um than this one or other worlds than these and and it's just uh yeah i mean that's always been my thing i'm like you know what there's too much out there to explain without that. It's being. a huge drop. And I absolutely like, cause I, I don't want to keep you too long and I, I really right. appreciate your time, but this is, I didn't want to overdo it about the, you know, literary questions, especially when it came to um, something like Gwendy. Cause I don't want to traipse on something that like, eh, I can't really talk about that, but right. something for me, that's huge. And why I got so drawn into the dark tower um, was that um, there was so many, bridges to that reality it's almost you could taste it more because the it, the, 
the the skin of existence is that thin is that yeah, close? That's what, use, that's, that's what i was going to use is that word thin which he likes to use so yeah a lot absolutely yeah. <laughs> um that that like you can feel it in everything and that and when you read this it becomes that real it becomes keystone earth for you um and your connection to those worlds um in the walk-ins is just so it, it is real because people are experiencing things that they can't explain um you have people that their perceptions of reality are different than ours schizophrenics for example suffer that harder than anybody else and we treat them like garbage and it's, it's, it's crazy because reality is subjective and we're all going through a different type of reality, a different realization. How some of us are voting for the orange guy, like fuck. Right, right, right. Um, it's, it's a different, no offense to those out there, but you all suck. Uh, sorry. I <laughs> get it out every now and then. And even that I can, you know, I, I just had that discussion That's yesterday. Tough. Sorry to get you can break it down further <laughs> because it's like, it's like I I know people who who voted for the guy who are you know intelligent people and they have their reasons for voting. I can I for sure. disagree more. Mm -hmm. um, and there's that whole other group. The cult my best friend Matt that passed voting, but they're believing, and that's the part that's tough. You know, that's... because I actually have like oh, I have I have a couple close friends who are true believers, and I'm just like shit. Out of all the things in this world that you could, you know, kind of kind of. Uh, throw your your brains on the ground and, and believe in that's just yeah, there's so much cooler stuff than this this orange <laughs> turd so. yes for fuck's sake yeah. there's so many other things in this world uh and sorry to get you know super explicit i kind of do that uh unexpectedly uh <laughs> i uh that that's absolutely right like why would you put all your belief in something like it's just completely infathomable. Blows Occam's razor right out of the friggin' water. Um, you know, that whole uh, connection to, um, you know, uh, the th all things being equal, you know, like the least, yeah. you know, the likely explanation tends to, you know, whatever it is, I forget. The most ten uh, likely explanation tends to be the correct one. Um, and that, like, people aren't thinking that at all cognitive dissonance is high and now we're all relying on uh this guy to kind of run us into the ground hopefully now things are going to change um and we all have yeah, our it's coming, you to, know, it's coming to an end yes i yeah, hope an oh my god an interesting end <sighs> scary ends for me um <laughs> on that note we're getting uh kind of close and i i know we're uh sorry if we, we rolled over a little bit here oh no no um, problem at all i enjoyed it um, this has been a really, really great uh, conversation. And um, I, uh, I think that, you know, that exact thing about the other worlds and the connections. And I feel bad for any of the literary guys going like, you didn't talk at all about uh, yeah, the new thing. Talk about, we, talk about, we can talk about books. Do it another time, time uh, because I think that this stuff is so much more important. And that's why I really do this is because, Real conversations with real people um, are what's going to, I think, and not to get preachy, I do this all the time in every episode, the end of every episode, but that's what's going to get us out of this. If we just stop assuming what the other person's saying and start listening to each other. So yeah. um, right. on that note, you know, um, unless uh, you have anything to follow up on that, I'm going to get you on your way. Um, and uh, I, uh, I really appreciate your time, uh, Rich. This has been... Um, uh, uh, a spectrum of emotions for me to be completely honest, because it's, 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 it's nice to be able to connect with somebody uh, who feels similar, who's also a creator. So yeah, those creators out there, um, thank you for listening. And well, thanks thank for you. having me on and, and let's do it again, man. Absolutely. Thank you Take so much. Care. Take care. Bye. All right, bye. I feel ultra bad that I kept him. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, a couple extra minutes longer, uh, and we just got so into the conversation, but we're only about four minutes past. And, um, you know, I think that's a major drop for everybody in the literary community. And again, I apologize to our listeners who really love Rich Chismar. Also, we, I would have gotten in so much more, but for me, the show is so much more about the person we're talking to and so much less about the superficial stuff on the top and and that's not saying in any way wendy's uh, uh final task is that because that is one of the most exciting things for me uh but i didn't want to fanboy it so much that we weren't really getting into 
what matters, you know? And I think that's what's all happening to you. And it, it makes it more real, at least for me. And, um, you know, that's why I'm doing it. Not for the rest of you guys, for myself. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it is partly selfish. I, uh, I love talking to you guys. I love, you know, having anyone who wants to come on the show, basically come on the show and then having, you know, amazing writers, um, take their time out of their incredibly busy schedule writing with Stephen fucking King uh, to come talk to us about life, the universe and everything and the worlds. Um, so you guys be in the moment, be in your world. And if you need to escape, don't use the fucking internet. Use, use a book. I, uh, I have the hardest time following along with books um, because of the ADHD, it gets so scattered. Audiobooks, the same thing. Some of the easiest ways for me to do is just to force myself to do both. Listen along with somebody, crank the speed up to 1.2 or 1.1, depending on the narrator, and get through that. Because once I'm in it, it's, the, it's everything. Um, and, it, and it's far better than these digital escapes that are scrambling our minds because pretty soon we're going to be connected to all that. And that's, that's something I did want to go into too, but I'm sure we're going to do this again. Me and Rich talk every now and then. Um, and I, uh, I really look forward to getting more interviews uh, as engaging as this one. Um, like Ryan recently, uh, I know not everybody's political. Um, and uh, I know <laughs> me and Rich kind of align politically, but I didn't want to go so far into that. And actually, I didn't want to go into it at all uh, to, you know, hurting listeners uh, who feel a little different. But if you listen to the rest of our stuff, you'll see where I stand there, too, um, as well as uh, our co-host who's um, here when he can be. Um, uh, he's a great guy uh, as well. Um, so not to rant, but that's what we do here at Abstract Transmissions. Uh, we start at one point and then never get back to the other. Uh, no, but seriously... Um, spend more of that time listening to people and doing what we're doing here. Start your own podcast. Um, send more videos to the people you love instead of texts because they're misinterpreting what you're saying. And when they can look in your eyes and they can see it, maybe it's digital, but it's still better than sending that text. K, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's make those connections to other people. Um, and, and, and really kind of normalize uh, the talking um, back and forth. Um, but again, I don't mean to get too preachy with this stuff. I just wanted to um, kind of close things up a little bit after a really great interview. I absolutely um, can't imagine uh, a better uh, scenario um, for conversation than the one I just had. And I think that just goes to show that we all just want to talk um, to each other um, really when it comes down to it. I think the people are longing, longing for connection. Um, and sometimes for some of us who struggle with the social aspects, it's easier to find those connections to real characters in a book because we, this reality is as thin as you perceive it. And every single one of us has a different perception. And that perception is literally your reality. And it's not the same to other people because they don't experience the same perception, same reality. So be nice to those people. And if you uh, want to escape, read a good book. As always, abstract here, abstract. Extract transmissions.